<clears throat> hey, John. Good afternoon, Rick. I just left you a message to see if you could add me as a co-host to the Zoom. Oh, yeah, good call. Hmm, I can make you the host. There you go. I, I got to tell you, I am loving that Zoom AI for the meeting. Yeah, isn't that awesome? That's fantastic. Fantastic. Love it. Let me get my notes up here. I figure we'll give everybody a couple of minutes and get on. Yeah, so good call. Three or so after. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. So people are coming out of one meeting, going to another. Mm -hmm. To do something with my lighting in here because I have a window so I get lit on one side. Yeah, I took it. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Hey, Bill. Hello. <clears throat> There's Lily. Hi, Lily. Lily and Julianne's coming. <clears throat> Lily probably built some of the content we're going to be checking out today. <laughs> Julianne's here. And here I thought I was early. <laughs> I was like, no one's going to be there. I'll just turn it on. Yeah, we're, we opened this up about 10 minutes before. <clears throat> Bill, have you ever heard of green AI or tried to use that? Or maybe we talked about that already. I have, I haven't, I haven't tried using it yet though. It's pretty incredible. Oh, the summary that it produces is just, it's, it's really, it's not just a, like a record of like, this was said, then this, it has that too. It has a transcript, but then it'll provide a summary where yeah. it'll be like these six people discussed a wide range of topics, including, you know, <laughs> yeah. the follow-up action items are, you know, yeah. John said he would do this by next Thursday. Yeah. It's just, it's great. It's really cool. <laughs> Yeah, WebEx has a tool that's similar, um, and that's one of the things that we've been, or I've been leveraging with a lot of my WebEx meetings, <clears throat> is that, it, it, and it, you're right, it's amazing. I mean, it'll even, like, in WebEx, it'll even, like, highlight. Yeah, it'll, yeah. It'll sit there and highlight what it, what, what it thinks is the most important part of the transcript. It's, like, it's incredible. It's great. This is great. We should also just 
record Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Can you start that, Rick? We might as well start it. Well, uh, yeah, might as well start it now. So that way everybody's notified. And that could sort of serve as the okay. notification that we're recording. If they'll get that when they join. Yeah. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hi Paul. Paul. Perfect. Jeff Wenzel made it back from San Diego. Yes, I did. Welcome, mm -hmm. welcome back. Hey Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hey Sean. Hey, Sean. I didn't have the kind of delays that Bill had on the way back from IMSH, but are coming or going, right? <laughs> Man. Yeah, either or. On the way out, I had some delays, but not as not nothing like Bill on either side of it. It was. I had a very turbulent flight from Phoenix to Madison. Unfortunately, Ooh. Wednesday night, very very turbulent the whole time. No no pretzels and cookies for for our flight. Ooh. They wouldn't even let the attendants get out of their seats. It was really bad. The f my flight was good. It was just 24 hours after. So but <laughs> I, I I did get to see a really neat museum while I was in Phoenix. So, uh, you know, I got to I got to see a, a really nice museum, um, real small, um, run by the city of Phoenix. Uh, it, it, it's a Pueblo museum, but it was really neat. It was really neat. Awesome. Everyone, it's three o'clock, but we're going to give everyone just a couple more minutes. So we'll start probably just before five after. That way people who have to transition and might be just joining will have a few minutes. What was the coolest thing that either of you, that you saw, Bill, at IMSH? Um, I think for, for me, it was um, Access VR. And that was their, awesome. Their ability, their the the way that they have it set up for putting in 360 video and then being able to put quizzes over top of it, be able to put stuff in it. I'm 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 like chomping at the bit for that one. I really liked that one. So um, much potential there. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I mean, obviously, I saw a lot of like you know cool busted up bodies and all of that, which you know I enjoy. <laughs> but, um, but. Uh, for 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 me uh, access vr was definitely definitely cool yeah they're they're awesome jeff did you see anything cool at imsh uh i always do um my focus is a little bit more on um what's been updated with the types of equipment that we currently have so mine was more of um mm -hmm. we're looking at a, a newer birthing mannequin to replace mm. the one we have. So um, Laredell's coming out with a birthing one. Um, Victoria is just overkill for what we use. So it's not worth the expense for that. And then um, <clears throat> we're not a CAE user. So having another platform just would not make sense for us. So, <clears throat> and then um, I always like just to go around and see um, the types of um, wearables for SPs. And to see if there's anything that's newer, we did find one um, IV trainer, which is more small and fits on the arm like a sleeve. Um, we use our SPs or even our mannequins and they'll put IVs in, but then we students always have to use like stopcocks and all that stuff in order to get it to work. And it's just so unreal. Whereas this one, there's just this little wearable thing that's got a bag and it's the gravity and it's usually with a... 50 ml bag so you can actually infuse and when you infuse it'll go up and then go back down so you're not um it blowing up something you know but you're still uh using it. and it's um silicone skin and it you can get like 400 500 sticks you know before it has to be replaced so i think that's and we've been searching for something like that for a long time very cool awesome yeah, the SP, the the uh, the I don't know if it's an SP or if it's a wearable or both, but the birthing 
demonstration that's ongoing at IMSH was the first, was a real eye opener my first year going to that. You know, the first time you hear it, you're like, whoa, somebody's in serious like pain. And then you hear it again. Yeah, the F bombs are flying. <laughs> <laughs> and then you hear it over and over and over yeah. for three days. You yeah. get used to it after a while. Or maybe you don't, I guess. I don't think yeah. I've ever got used to that. But it's always like, you know, IMSH is starting when you hear the the yeah. birthing simulator going. Yeah. Um, the, okay, I the just where... want to welcome the folks that have just joined and let you know you're not missing anything. This is just a little bit of the pre-chat. We're going to start promptly at 3.05, so a little less than a minute. We're going to kick this off. The wearable one was just a little bit um, too big at this point in the game. Um, so I think once it gets kind of refined a little bit as technology changes a little bit, it's, it's, it's a cool process and a cool product. Um, it just needs to get a little bit more compact because you have wide, wide ranges of <clears throat> SPs that we'll use. And if you have somebody that's, you know, five foot two, they look like they're having triplets, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. For everybody just joining us, we're talking about the International Medical Simulation and Healthcare Conference that was just in San Diego last week few of us were out there checking that out and it's always always a lot of fun if you haven't gone i would highly recommend it it can definitely be an eye opener it's probably one of the weirdest conferences you'll ever go to in terms of the the, the content the types of things that you'll see i mean there's just about every body part you can imagine and uh represented in all different ways it's really really pretty interesting my, my cousin works at the convention center and she came down to see us the last time it was in san diego and she's like what kind of a weird business are you in, John? Like, this is the weirdest conference I have ever seen here. And I've seen some weird stuff, but this one is, there's like injured dogs and just uh, everything you can imagine. Okay, well, I have 305, so I'm going to officially get us kicked off here and welcome everybody to our Acaticus Community of Practice call. This is a forum that we've started uh, last summer. We try to run it quarterly, where we invite everybody that is a member of the Academicus community to join us, and we spotlight or highlight one of those organizations or members um, that are leveraging Academicus, and then give them an opportunity to present and talk about their experience and how they're using the platform and what they're doing and how they're doing it. Because as we all know, this is, uh, you know, this is kind of new territory and we're all kind of blazing the trail, trying to figure this all out. And when we think about community of practice, it's not like there's a rule book of standards out there yet on how you do you teach in VR. And so we're all kind of trying, you know, scratching our heads and experimenting. And we thought that, you know, it just would help everybody, including a catechist, to get together on a periodic basis hear from somebody who's willing to present what they're doing, and then just have some discussion and question and answer and uh, sharing going on so that we can kind of keep moving this ball forward down the field. And so that's exactly what we'll be doing today. We'll do some introductions in a moment. My name's Rick Castile. I am the Customer Experience Specialist with Academicus. This will be my second year working with, uh, with the team. I do uh, the demos and the, some of the support and some of the training with uh, with the group. And um, just want to kind of introduce everything that's going to be happening today. A few housekeeping items, and I'll be letting folks in the, from the waiting room while we're doing this. We are recording today, just so you know that. Um, we will ask you to stay on mute uh, while our speaker is presenting. And if you have questions or thoughts, things you don't want to forget, place them in uh, in the chat. We will absolutely round uh, back on them um, and make sure that your questions or comments get, uh, get addressed. Um, uh, I'm going to put a link in the, uh, in the chat in just a moment. And this link will direct you to a web page which has links to all of our social media sites. And we really hope that you will visit us, join us on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter and Discord. And all the links to those platforms are there. We're 
We're trying to do a better job this year of getting the word out about what we're doing and how you can leverage Acaticus across all those platforms. So we hope that you will, will tune into that. Especially out there on LinkedIn, we've created a specific community of practice group. And this is one of those places where, again, just a catechist uh, community members will be able to join and, and ask questions, share ideas, uh, uh, share what they're doing. And again, that will be a private group that's just open to, uh, to a catechist customers. So check that link out in a few minutes and, uh, and be sure to, to friend us and join us at those uh, uh, social media locations. All right, well, I am going to turn it over to some other folks so that they can do their own introductions. And then we'll round around to Paul Cusick, who's our speaker today. And so right now I'm gonna to toss it over to my colleague, uh, Bill Ballow. Bill, take it away. All righty, uh, Bill Ballow. I am uh, here at Madison College in our Extended Reality Center. Um, and I also uh, do part-time work for um, for a catechist, um, sort of, you know, helping with development and um, customer experiences as well. John, I'm going to send it to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Great to uh, have everybody here for another community of practice. I'm John Bruchot. I am the founder and CEO of Arch Virtual, the developers of the Acaticus platform. And uh, I'm excited today to, to introduce Paul Cusick. So I'm going to I'm going to first paste a link. Paul was the last guest on our um, community of, or uh, not community of practice, our, um, our pulse. Oh, I had the link handy. Here we go. Sorry for the delay. Here is a link to the pulse. The pulse, if you're not already aware, is a, a video series that we put together where we highlight uh, various, you know, innovators working within the Academicus community, not unlike the community of practice, but we're really focused on one individual and one program. And Paul was our latest guest. So if you uh, like what you hear today and you want to learn more, uh, ch definitely check that out. He was um, able to share a lot of insights there. So uh, Paul is the director of technology at Minnesota State University at Mankato. And I found, found Paul's very first inquiry about a catechist june 18th 2020 he says i would like to get a demo and see what this is all about i'm the director of technology at minnesota state university and i would like to schedule a demo as soon as possible and a few months later uh, we had a purchase order and we were off and running and what i really like about paul is paul is a very big thinker um, he's got a big vision for what uh, he wanted to do right from the get-go it was, you know, he he knew that the School of Nursing was interested and they were going to do some things with it. But then he started taking it in all different directions. And we're going to go on a little tour today. We're going to open up a catechus and I'll be able to show you as Paul is describing it, as we're talking about it, some of the content, some of the experiences. And you're going to see it's all across the board. We're going to go into social work and speech therapy and all kinds of things. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Hi, everyone. Thanks for that introduction, John. I appreciate it. Um, as John said, I my name is Paul Cusick. I have been the Director of Technology for the College of Allied Health and Nursing and the College of Education here at MSU for a little over a decade. Um, about 12 years ago, our centralized IT staff wanted to parse people out into the colleges to give ourselves a little bit more depth and range and understanding of our customer base. So they made these director roles uh, mainly because of simulation was one of the big reasons. Uh, the specialized nature and IT needs in simulation uh, kind of pushed us out into that field and role. So I stepped into it very early on when we had one SIM 3G mannequin, uh, very low AV technology. We were barely recording at the time, and now we've progressed to a uh, 32 suite simulation center. Uh, that's one of the largest here in southern Minnesota and can provide uh, simulations from birthing to surgery um, and everything in between at this point. So um, like John said, I came into this uh, about four or five years ago, coming into it thinking that uh, it was a new technology and we wanted to try and help supplement some of the things that we were doing in simulation. At the time, I had a dean who was very invested in technology and believed that this could be 
help very much so in our simulation efforts um, because we were spending a lot of money at the time on mannequins and environments and uh, SPs and all these different places that we wanted to go with. I think the key that it came back to for us was how do we represent simulation in a positive way because we were a very unique nursing program at that time. Um, we our niche for nursing has been family nursing. And so when I went on the search for VR uh, equipment and VR software, I went through a lot of the other companies who were able to provide subscriptions or these one time very well drawn out um, VR experiences, but none of them really fit our exact curriculum. And so trying to be that interface between the technology and the curriculum, I was having a hard time figuring out how we could really make that transition well. Backing up a few steps, I actually got my degree in education and then became a director of technology. So my thought process has always been pedagogy and the discussions around how, when we implement technology, is it actually helping the education versus it just being a, a tool to kind of fly around and make things look nice. Um, VR kind of seems that way or had seemed that way for me at the front end, because you have everybody's attention once you put the headset on, but are you actually going to capture their attention and retain it once you kind of get down the road a little bit? Critical thinking skills, those types of things can happen really easily, but they could also be just overlooked for the cool factor. And, and that's where I really wanted to make sure that our VR program was going to be extending. Uh, to do that, uh, like John said, I, I requested a demo and he was like, we can build whatever you want. And I'm like, Okay, I, I, I like that theory, but I've heard a lot of people say they could build you whatever you want and it comes out on the other end to be something very different than what it was. And so I think at that time, John, I think I sent you like a, a, a picture folder of our entire Sim Center and said, these are the places we have now and we're trying to replicate it in some sort. I don't need it to be an actual exact representation, but this is what we're going after. And so that's where we started. Um, I think one of the other things before we get too far down the road is to get started. I went to the university and said, I want a one-time money ask uh, for a lot of dollars because it's a lot easier at our university to uh, get one-time money than reoccurring money. And I don't know how that works at some of the other institutions, but sustaining money is difficult because, it, you know, like a faculty line or any of those things are difficult to get past because of the commitment to the years. And so when I went to the university, I said that I would like to get 60 $70,000 to put into this, knowing I only needed $10,000 to get the annual license going, but that there were gonna be customizations that I wanted to make, custom rooms. I also wanted the ability to have some of that sustaining dollars in years two, three, and four, so that I wouldn't have to be chasing this down later and so that I could effectively tell faculty they can invest with this without it going away in years two, three, or four. So for me, it was the one-time money ask up front. But then I started looking at down the road, if, if I only have this for a couple of years, how is this going to be supported? And so in our institution here, it's very difficult to have $10,000 just sitting there waiting for you at the department level. But it is a little bit easier for that to happen at a collegiate level, at the college level where eight departments are underneath us. And so to make it worth it for our college to want to continue to support this, my thoughts went to how do I broadcast a catechist out of more than just nursing? And so that's what brought me into speech and human performance, which houses our sport management group and sports law group, uh, our social work group, and a couple other groups that will be coming, hopefully coming on board in, in the near future as well. Because the more that I have of them invested in the catechists, the more it, it, it's, it's much easier for the college to leverage those funds and say that we're going to support the entire college then with that. It's, it's not like they're giving $10,000 that only supports part of the college and everybody is allowed to come and collaborate at any point in time, they can seek me out to do that. So that's how we started. We got started uh, initially with the nursing group because that was where a lot of this stuff what began. And, and we put got the startup with a small little nursing med surge room, bed, head wall, um, patient monitor. We were basically, like I said, trying to replicate some of the things that we were doing in simulation. But the bigger key was how were we going to expand? What were we gonna do above and beyond that? And I think one of the discussions we had was, well, let's pull back a little bit and see if we can get an entire nursing floor because we were trying to capture that in simulation, but it gets a little sketchy when you're working inside of products like V-Line with only four windows that you're gonna have a view of the nursing center from the, uh, the nurse station, as well as a view inside of the, the nursing rooms, the med surge rooms, uh, a spot for the patient monitor. And so for those people watching all those things, it got to be 
a, a little bit difficult to try and represent all those environments. And so in VR, I was like, maybe that would be an easier way to do that. And, and so we were able to design and build not only a couple of the nursing rooms, but then build some of the nursing stations like John's presenting here as well. And, and so this allowed us now to have multiple representations of environments where we could put different patients in different rooms and have all those things happening at once. We didn't have to stop and reset up. We didn't have to have different kinds of standardized patients. We didn't have to have different stories being told because all the stories are sitting there right in front of us. And so we could do simultaneous simulations uh, like never before. And, and so that is this process has actually helped us perform better in simulation because of our capacity to learn how to do these types of simultaneous simulations. When we do a simulation back in the day, it was a one-on-one -on -one thing. It was one story, the nurse had to be prepared for one thing, but in a true situation, nurses need to be prepared for all the different pieces of the puzzle. And that was something that we were trying to broadcast and help with as we were going through um, a lot of this. I didn't mention that I would be happy if, if people have questions along the way, if they want to stop me or jump in and chat at any point in time uh, of anything that I'm saying, um, I, I will probably be rolling pretty fast and furious through a lot of these things. Um, but again, my, my background and my history comes from uh, pedagogy and teaching and an educational sense. And so when my thoughts always come to why we're doing these things, why are we trying to invest in this? Um, I have a real strong feeling towards synchronous, trigger-based, facilitated types of simulations or experiences. And, and the reason for that for me is because that's where the critical thinking happens. Um, a lot of things in VR come back to the ability to have more of a learner-centered model versus a teacher-centered model. And that's a game changer for a lot of people. Some people aren't ready for that. Some people are. But the experiences that I've seen of faculty that go in there is that that comes out almost genuinely as they're coming through the VR because they see the students' experiences. They see the students' motivation. The students want to learn these things. They charge forward with their own perspectives. And all the teachers have to do is sit back and kind of hit a couple of controls here, figure out a trigger of how to mention something like this here or there. It's the things that we really wanted in regular simulation, but it feels like it's in an even safer environment. And Bill Vallow and I were talking about that a little bit ago that that even places like uh, standardized patients and things like that in VR, there, there's a safe part of aspect to that, that that really plays a really cool role in VR, that that's what we're trying to provide in simulation, right? Where simulation was broadcast to be this place where you can go have very low occurring things that might be very high impact, but you might not see that if you're ever in an internship, yet we can present those in simulation. Well, even better, we can prevent, present them in VR and we could do that across the country, across the world. And standardized patients no longer need to be in our space, in our center, or even on our campus. And, and so those types of things will really broaden and open up the door once we understand how to properly educate within VR, in my opinion. And so that's where my mind then rolls to all these other programs that we ended up bringing on board was because I'm no longer hampered by just a nursing outlook or what can happen in nursing because right now simulation physical simulation is still pretty standard in nursing and there might be a couple of other pieces we might bring in athletic training and have them do something i know emt and those kinds of places will have some of those pieces for physical sim but it, it was really hard for us to bring in something like social work and so when they approached me about three years ago and we had already had a catechist and they said well we want to build a room and we want to destroy it and we want to make it really smelly and we want to put hoarding trash all over it and i said this is a perfect opportunity for vr because we don't want you to destroy that room that room will cost us a lot of money to destroy and you can destroy and redestroy all these rooms in vr and we can get an absolutely excellent experience i wouldn't have that mentality had we not already had vr on campus so there's something to be said about that that nursing helped bring it in but there's also something to be said that once you understand the implications of what VR can do, it shouldn't also just be housed in nursing. Um, it, it can go into so many other places. So, John, I can pause there if we have any questions or concerns before I kind of start rolling into all of the other programs that we've led this into. I, I was going to make a comment, um, if that's okay. Uh, I, Please. What I, what I like about what you did there, um, Paul, is that you you created that I, I i was using like a little four bay er with little you know dividers in it and when that came in 
um, I went, ooh, okay, hold on. All those patients that I was using in that four bay ER, I'm just going to pull them over and I'm going to put them in. I'm going to take these out. I'm going to put mine in. And, and, you know, and even with the new sequencer too, like, right. So, right. so with the, with the, you know, the asthma, uh, emphysema CHF, I was just showing that to one of my instructors today, did the same thing, right. Just put that patient in there and said, okay, this is the patient that I want in there. And now I can kind of go from there. Um, so it's, it's really cool to see how something that, that y'all built then is, can be used like by me and I looked at it in a different way. We even talked about that in our conversation earlier today is like, you know, with this farmhouse that you were talking about, um, like we were looking at it in two totally different ways and it kind of got us talking about like all the different things that could be done with this right. one asset, which I thought was amazing. Yep. And Paul, this is Rick. I'm watching the uh, comment section. We don't have any questions right now. So roll right along. And Bill, thanks very much. And I just want to open it up for the group. This is going to be a discussion. So don't hesitate if you want to interject something, um, you know, throw your hand up and we'll pause and, and let you get a word in. Well, since we were talking about the farmhouse, should we just jump right over there? Do you want to go there, straight there? Yeah, we'll go straight there. We'll we'll stop back at the, uh, we have a really cool, the stadium is really cool. We got to check that out. And the speech therapy sim was pretty cool too, but while we're talking about this, this is the dilapidated farmhouse. Funny story here, Stefan just joined too. He he can speak oh, to this great. as well. But I thought it was funny that, you know, they um, hide, hide the controls here. But we created a, a dilapidated farmhouse in the, you know, and I went in and I thought, oh man, this is, this is really a, a beat up old house. And uh, they came in and they were like, it's not beat up enough. We need it more beat up than that. And so it really challenged our team to create, um, you know, a pretty, a pretty dilapidated. Well, so pause right there, John. So the first thing that they said was that flag was not, the flag looked like it was a beautiful American flag. And so the first thing that we come back to is you need to shred that flag. You need to make it look older and worse and dilapidated. And it's like, think about what we're saying. We're trying to make things worse and worse. And so to explain to Stefan about how much worse we're making this, I mean, we basically had to start to tell the stories that we had in our head. And so to Bill's point, when we looked at this, our minds went all five of these different places that we could go. But in the instructor's mind, it was very clear. She had already seen a house like this. She had been at a house like this. And the floorboards were so creaky, she didn't want to walk on them. So then we told Stefan about that. We were like, porch has got to be broken up because it's got to make us think about that. Even if you were to spin around, there's a spot up on the hillside where there's a dog that's chained to a tree. And it was a really important part of this scene was to have the dog that's chained up there, up on the top up there, on the top of that hill right there. And it's because there's a radius around that tree that's all carved out by dirt now, there where there is no grass. And what that story was supposed to tell is, are you safe in this environment? How close can you be to that tree? How close should you be can that dog get away and escape? Um, I think it's just up to the left a little bit. Yep, right in front of you, right there to your right. Oh, I, I see it. Sorry, this is Stefan. Um, it got moved closer Stephen. to the, the path down there. Uh, so it's actually behind you. Behind you now. Okay. Sorry, Sorry, I don't want to make it up. Right there. It's that and tree. then I looked at it from an EMS perspective, too. And I went, first of all, today, um, it was kind of neat because I said, I, I can smell this scene. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes. Um, and, and, and then I said, like, you know, this would be really great for scene safety for my right. medic students. Right. You know? And I didn't even know about the dog earlier. Like this is, this is even better because now it's, is this scene truly safe? If not, why not? If so, how so? And this goes to some of the back and forth that we have when we're, we're dealing with the catechist, because we have to talk to Stefan in a way that he not only can develop this, but understand why that that there is a radius this dog can't get out of, that, that we can't have piles of poop out in the driveway because the dog can't get that far. And so the realism of the safety aspect is exactly that. We have to describe in such ways and storytell in such ways that help to re reinforce that immersive experience. So I thought that was one of the cool points about that. The other piece of this that everybody should know is that we're, in, we're working with social workers who are trying to train their students of what to expect and how to be safe within a house. And so we've actually brought in other people from the community at certain times to have these discussions. And one of the discussions we had was 
as we were about ready to walk into the house, which we're going to do right now, as a social work student, did you think to contact the police before you walked in? Or was it the door was already open and you just decided you were going to walk in anyways? Do you feel safe right now? And do you feel safe moving into this? Can you imagine that we're asking somebody if they feel safe and they're in a classroom with a headset on? That's how immersive this is. That's how great this product is and can do is because if you were to walk into that, I don't know if I would feel safe and I'm not sure if it's healthy. You don't know if what you're breathing is okay, if you wanna to touch anything. So again, we did all this in many steps. Stefan helped us obviously from the top to the bottom, but we came back and we were like, we need to add cats because of the smell and we need to add trash everywhere. And we need things to be dilapidated so much that you don't even think you wanna sit down or that it would be safe to sit anywhere or touch anything. And so that was what the theory of this house that was built. Now, moving on further from this, obviously this house can represent a, a lot of ideas like Bill was describing. He sees it in a completely different way than we did. And the, the social worker that I was working with saw this as, well, here's the first part. What do you see as a student? What are you looking at? What are you noticing? And then you transform it into five different simulations. You can see a weapon there. So this might be one where there is a boyfriend that is controlling his girlfriend and that there is a very threatening situation and they haven't been able to upkeep the house because they're on drugs. There might be an overweight uh, man or woman that cannot help to keep, take care of anything or hasn't left the upstairs or that bed since whenever. Um, we can add all the different stories now in all the different contexts that we can go through. And I think here was the trick that, that kind of set us over the edge was, as our students are experiencing this, they're thinking in certain ways of how they're gonna react as social workers. And one of the stories that came up with that was, lots of times social, works, social workers are asked to come to these places because somebody else had entered that house first and said, wow, we need some help. Somebody needs some help here. And who were those first people that actually came into the house? And we figured, we started finding out that it could be the police, it could be the fire department, it could even be your HVAC specialists, your power company, your cable man, because lots of times they're the first person that comes in and says, my cable's out and it's not working because nobody's maintained the house in three years and, and some of those things. And so by doing that recently, we've actually invited all those people to come in and experience this house. And we had a 67 year old sheriff come in and put a headset on for the first time and navigate his way through this house. And he stated that um, he would like all of his officers trained in this. And so that was the immediacy, the immediate effect of this is that it was not only going to impact our academics, but it was going to impact our community and, and that a place like this can now be leveraged to do that. And so for him in that instance with the police, we were going to add in now different assets to help with their training, whether it's drugs, paraphernalia, weapons. Um, one of the first things I asked that officer or that sheriff when he came in here with his VR headset is I said, how many weapons did you find in the house? Because I don't even know how many they were in there. And he found 13 and I only saw six. And so mm -hmm. I was like, the, the keen eye, the differences, the way that they're looking, the things that he said were a weapon that I didn't even recognize were would be a weapon. Um, and the way that they see those things are all different things. Um, while we're standing here and looking at this part of it, the next iteration of this house will be um, basically interactive kitchen because we want the capability to open the refrigerator and see what's in it. It'll tell a story in and of itself of there's only a couple of objects in the refrigerator, what those objects are. You can see the drug paraphernalia on the table. We want to be able to open cupboards and understand those things because those are all things that tell a story whether a person is here or isn't here that about how they lived here and what happened. And so that is the next iteration that we'll be doing with this house, massive over iteration. The other iterations that we'll be doing is how I'm working with Rick right now to get trained in to just drop in more of the assets so that I can create iterations without having to um, put that back on development at a catechist, but that we can reuse this house in so many different ways because everybody who knows working with technology, it seems like as soon as you build it, you better rebuild it because it's gonna be outdated by the time it's done. And so it's a never ending process, but that is the truth, uh, in my opinion, of the power of a catechist versus some of these other programs where all you can do is sit there and live with what you bought um, we're constantly improving and, and the developers and everybody else at a catechist is as well. And, and, and that's what helping to, to meet our needs. Um, I forgot to mention while we're doing a lot of that stuff and work with the communities, we're getting a lot of that funded by the United Way here locally so that there will be a grant that helps to pay them for their time and their training. And that will also help to pay for our um, updates and customizations. Those are creative ways that we're finding 
um, to help fund the projects moving forward and to help find different ways that we can keep this thing uh, kind of moving down the tracks. So, and, and I just want to interject here, Paul, because something you and Bill both spoke to is is the power of using this medium, using a catechist to tell a story, right? That you're guiding your students through. And I know, you know, one of the biggest challenges that I run into as I work with organizations moving to using VR in training is, is there's this kind of thought or expectation that you're gonna be in there and checking off a box to do things. Um, and and it, it's so much more expensive than that. And to your point where you can take one setting like this, and it's just not one scene that you're running through, there's five or six different ways to look at and utilize these, these scenes to teach varying different ways, right? This, this could be, you know, for social work, these could be nursing, making home visits, this could be EMS uh, on an emergency call, this could be police, fire, I mean, so many different ways that this this can be leveraged. And, and again, it's not just, you know, this fly up that comes up and said, did you make, do this step check? Um, and then you move on, right? It's that interaction they're having with an expert like yourself or Bill or, or uh, another content expert that's helping them think and problem solve and, and creatively look at how you address a whole variety of situations that in real life you're going to run into and, and have to think your way through. Right. There is definitely something to be said also of not throwing away any iteration ever. Um, you know, Stefan had created that first house and it was a beautiful house. There wasn't anything wrong with it. It was gorgeous on the outside and gorgeous on the inside. We, there's social workers are going to walk into places like that as well. That wasn't the original intent because they wanted to go to the depths and the breaths of where this could, you know, bottom out. But at the same time, there'll be a time and place where we'll want to use that rural farmhouse setting where it looks right. And everything looks right, but it's very wrong inside. And where you find those very wrong pieces of the puzzle um, will happen. The reason all this works in VR is because it is safe again, though, because we're providing a safe environment to teach and train. 10, 15, 20 years ago, these students would have had to learn by being on site. They would have had to been in these exposed in these experiences. Uh, Bill was talking about before that you get sheltered. Some of those people might not ever come out of their shell. They're very difficult to have in certain situations. And it's kind of like throwing somebody up on stage and telling them to sing. It's not a safe place until they're very confident in doing those things. I think that leveraging VR for that reason is one of the main pieces or the main reasons I was able to broaden to all these other departments is because they want to do that. And so the next one or one of the next ones that we can show too is the, the stadium, the soccer stadium that we built. And we built this was because it was going to be difficult to bring 30, 50, 80 students to a stadium to have a discussion about what is right, what is wrong, where, where can we go, what do you see um, is impactful, where do you see problems, and in general, what do you see? And so um, I reached out to our sports management uh, professor and asked her what she thought she would like to see in this. And she said, well, where do I start? And I said, that's exactly the point. Where do you start? And so we started here at a stadium entrance. And so these people are, are being taught risk management. They're being taught sports law. They're being taught uh, stadium management. And so one of the things that we were doing in this scene was to figure out points of entry. Are there problems with the points of entry? Do you see exit signs? Is there valid signage everywhere? What's happening in our people bringing in bags? Like it said here with the informational, uh, and these were the awesome pieces that came after the fact, was that we could drop in now the triggers that I talked about before that are so important to make sure that you hit your learning objectives. You just make sure those triggers are there. Now we added these triggers so that they could go on these solo missions and have these triggers happening without facilitation. But these triggers can also obviously be happening with a facilitator on board. Um, we were able to bring in some of these kinds of question and answers to drive home the critical thinking. Again, this isn't a PowerPoint. This isn't us saying, do this, this, and this. This is how it's done. This is where it should go. This is a, a question to get them to think about it. Where, where would you go in a situation like this? Because every stadium is different. Um, and so when we built this, we had to go back into our depths of why are we here? Not everything's going to be perfect. There isn't going to be a gate 
Or, you know, and when I was working with Stefan, we were trying to figure out, do we need to make sure that they can't get through here or they can? And we were like, no, the, the lack of perfection is actually what drives home a lot of the learning. And so that's where we wanted these people to do that. Now, you'll see a lot of these holocrons in the back that say load. The reason that those were there was that we actually built a way for solo mission for all the students who are in headsets to go on these solo missions and allow them to go from scene to scene. If you know, and you've been users of a catechist, you know, as an admin, you're the only one that kind of direct everybody from one scene to the next. We put in these holocrons so that if we pushed everything into a solo mission, we could have, I think we have eight, 10 headsets at a time. We could have all eight 10 pe to 10 people doing all the different scenes at their own pace. Um, and so overlooking them and helping to facilitate those, we could still get through a, a few more than, than what we could do before. We were allowed to build more of a conference room that kind of allowed them to pick and choose how to get into these pl places. But the real key here is what Bill was saying earlier. We kind of had a designated view of how this is gonna work for uh, sports management people, but how would this work for EMTs? And how would this work for nurses? And how would this work for social workers who are presented in situations where there's a fight happening in the stadium and, and different pieces like that? Um, the one that uh, John's pulling up right now is a lightning strike. Um, and lightning strike went clear across the board with our nursing group, with our uh, social work group, and also obviously with our sports management group. So once the lightning strike is triggered, very large audio that comes with it. Um, now what? Where do you go? Who do you attend to first? Um, these are sports management people. They're not nurses. So they have to kind of have followed processes. But again, you might be able to go to a stadium and, and have thoughts and discussions about this, but there's no way you're going to actually have that presented in front of you so that you actually have to react to it. Um, and then there you can see the ambulance bill that we were talking about. Yep. Exit and entry. Where do they get to? How do they get to it? Why is it down on the field versus outside of the stadium? All those things I'm sure you could speak to better than I can about with EMT stuff. Uh, and I used to work a lot of the uh, uh, high school football games when I when I worked uh, on the road uh, down in Florida where I where I grew up. And uh, and the area that I grew up in, the Tampa Bay area, is the lightning capital of the world. So it was like it was perfect. I, I saw this and I was like, oh well, I can use that. That's uh, you know so. We, we, we both came at it from different directions, but we both got to, to choose what we needed out of it, right. you know, and to say, I need this to be this, so I'm going to change it a little bit, and I need this to be this, so I'm going to change this a little bit. Um, but then, you know, I even see the possibility for some cross-collaboration, too, Absolutely. right, where now you could have those sports management people talking to the paramedics, and you have paramedics that are saying, well, okay – we would really prefer to come in this way because of this, or we would really prefer to be over here or, you know, um, where, where is our area, especially if we're talking about now a mass casualty, many people injured, where are we going to go from there? Absolutely. And that's how those discussions started with ours too. And putting those two people in the room is fantastic. The students don't ever interact with each other. They never thought they would. And they're basically showing off their own expertise. So they're all energized about the learning because they're like, oh, this is my wheelhouse, let me tell you. And they're like, well, this is my wheelhouse, let me tell you. And together, you hit a, an ultimate point that I don't think you get to in any classroom. So um, the ability for us to bring in assets was a big game changer for us, graphics and assets. Um, and that's more and more about what we're learning how to do right now with a lot of these things. But our ability to bring in these types of graphics were was gave us the flexibility to have these kinds of asynchronous solo missions be a little bit more uh, robust for everything. Um, I really like the power that this can do. You'll never hear me say that I believe asynchronous teaching is going to ever supersede uh, synchronous teaching and facil facilitated teaching. But if there was a way to do this and in the future when AI has the ability to give us powerful, unique feedback, it'll come out of these types of situations where you're giving the student the choice of how to learn, when to learn, where to learn, because I think that'll empower motivation as well. And so that's where we were going with a lot of these pieces. We wanted to reinforce what they were looking for. And, and so what this is, without being able to kind of read it right away, is in life-saving intervention ideas, who are you going to first? 
why are you going to them first? Is it the person with all the blood? Is it the person that is not breathing? Is it the person that, you know, whatever those things are, and <laughs> Bill will know this in spades, but somebody like me who was just an IT director was sitting there going, you need to explain this to me because I don't know the flow chart for this. So please help me. Yeah, and, and, and see, that's where I can kind of go, okay, so what I'm most interested in is based on a color group. And I color group based on this. And we, we use either either salt triage or start triage, either one. But, and then, you know, we, so we always try to, I shouldn't say we always try, but many times we try to like cut off the idea of the bloodiest person is the person we need to go to. Because right. the bloodiest person could be the least injured to believe it or not. So um, that's why we need to like, you know, have these conversations between the different the different um, entities so that we can really understand why one thinks one way and why one may think another way. And then how can we figure out where both of our worlds come together and then, you know, best treat our patients or best treat our customers, depending on who they may be. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You can see John's going through some of the pieces now that we have to add in for the simulation manager. This, all this stuff just helped with the immerse, immersion. The audio, the pieces of the real-time audio, this is where we learned in this setting that if you were on the opposite end of the stadium and you were trying to speak to the person right next to you in the headset, that's on the opposite side of the stadium, you can't hear them because of the audio is real in the VR. If you're on the opposite side of the stadium, you're not gonna hear them until you got closer and closer. That just made it all the more real. These students were trying to yell at each other and they could hear each other outside of the headsets, but they couldn't hear each other inside of VR. And so that was some of the other things that is something to be talked about at some point in time in one of these community of practices as well is how we set up in our VR labs, where the headsets are, the fact that you can have overlapping audios in and out of the headsets and what's the best way to facilitate that, whether you're in the VR facilitating or you're out of the VR facilitating it. I think the correct way to think about all that is all of it's worth it, but it, it needs to be represented in both pre-brief and debrief because that's where a lot of the learning still happens. A lot of the magic is still going to happen when you figure out the critical thinking after the experience, whether that's physical sim or VR. Um, and that's a well-known fact in, in physical sim that 60, 70, even up to 80 percent of your learning can happen uh, in the debrief, uh, let alone the actual. And, and being able to debrief with other people of other backgrounds and not just because all of us paramedics, we're going to get together and we're going to talk all of our paramedic stuff. And we're going to be like, okay, wow, we should have done this or we should have done that. Or, you know, this is what went well. This is what, but when we bring in other people, we bring in sports managers, we bring in those like people we wouldn't even think of. We've right. done simulation with nurses. We've done simulation with uh, surgical techs. We've done simulation with, we've done all of that, but like people we wouldn't even think of to say, Hey, we should have a simulation with them. I, I love that idea. No, yep, I agree completely. Um, I think one of the things that we might have hopped over, John, was the speech um, aspect of this. And it, it just reminded me with what we were talking oh, yeah. about that. And I don't know that we necessarily need to go into it. it. It just looked like a nursing room again. But one of the keys with the speech was our effective uh, playing of the patient with uh, one of our speech therapists in ghost mode. And so, yeah, this had come out of, originally we started with a nursing room. So we said, let's just build off of that nursing room. Uh, what can we do with that stuff? And how can we add in the pieces for our speech therapist? And so our speech therapist said, yes, please present the patient here. And we will have one of our speech therapists actually speak for this. And so this was the conversation we were all having a little bit earlier about you put somebody in ghost mode and that person can be anybody from a faculty member to another student to an actual SP from anywhere that maybe even is a, a ex patient or a current patient um, that would be able to speak to the students in a way that you wouldn't be able to do in the real world. And, and the main reason for that is in the real world, you, you still have to see these people. And so that, that SP might not act the same way. The students might not act the same way. But if you can bring out a student who wouldn't raise his or her hand in class, but would put on a VR headset and now have a full on discussion with a speech therapist because they made a connection that they couldn't make in the classroom. 
to me, that's where all the learning should happen. That's where everybody is. And so what triggered me to even think about that was Bill's just talking about how different perspectives meet in VR, all perspectives are open. It's more of like a free range of, you no longer are an introvert and an extrovert. Everybody's a, an avatar now. And so you have the capacity, you have the ability to live a little bit outside of your natural comfort zone because you don't see my face. I don't see your face, but our conversations are gonna be off the charts as long as they're being somewhat triggered. And so that's what we had. That's why we used a faculty member as our speech therapist because we were starting, still trying to hit learning objectives throughout the way. So while they're having this discussion back and forth, if they didn't make it to the part of why my speech impediment started, maybe the speech therapist would say, you know, way back in the day, I had a problem with this. And then they would try and trigger them to ask more questions about it. But they wouldn't just come straight out and say, why didn't you ask me about how this all started? They would try and trigger that conversation and facilitate it to the point where it seemed like the student was uncovering it. That's where a lot of our learning happened. That's why this hit home so much. And that's why we're still continuing to do these speech therapy uh, VR sessions, which are fantastic in my opinion. And they will continue to grow as, as our departments and our, uh, our programs grow with this as well. Another thing to be said with all of this is evaluation. Um, this might just be my own personal opinion, but formative evaluations are 10 times better than summative evaluations. And VR it hits, to the home, hits to the heart of that. If you don't know what formative versus summative, basically you're evaluating people on the fly as it's happening versus summative would be the test at the end. Why wouldn't we be evaluating people on the fly? Because we can make actual agile changes in VR while we're evaluating them. This isn't going well. You're not catching the drift. Let's reset and try it again versus waiting until they fail the test and saying, maybe you can retake the test again in two weeks. Well, now we can't even move on to the next step, right? Let's hit it right there. Let's move on. Um, and, and let's evaluate it based on what your strengths and skills are. You chose this path. It was a choose your own adventure and you chose this adventure. Why'd you choose it? And while they're explaining why they chose it, they just solved and evaluated. You just evaluated if they knew anything about it, but they told it in their story and they told it with their critical thinking cap on. Those are the pieces where I think VR uh, has legs um, and, and I've done a ton of research on it. I think that's where a lot of the international companies are going with this um, and international uh, schools are going with this. It, it's funny, I, I work in a group, an international group with uh, people from the Netherlands and they will take something and think about it and then think about it again and then wait six months and then they'll think about it again and then they'll put it into action. And they love to call me the wild, wild west because I'll take it and I'll throw it into the classroom and I'll see how the students react and I'll be like, nope, didn't work, let's try it again. And then we'll try it again and we'll figure it out and we're more like trial and error. And guess what? That's how different countries act with different things. But we have so much to learn from each other. They love hearing about my feedback from my kids. And I'm only getting those that feedback because I have a catechist to sit there and play around in, in an environment that I was able to create. Meanwhile, they're sitting there reading all these white papers going, oh, I don't think that's going to work. And I'm going to be like, it didn't work. I can tell you, it didn't work. And so now let's move on. Choose your next white paper and tell me if this one's going to work or not. And I'll show you whether it did or not. Um, so those are the types of places that VR has also allowed me to kind of learn more about learning habits, learning rituals, how we in America have our hesitations, but also how we take strides so quickly, which allows things like VR and a catechist to come to bear fruit in the first couple of years versus trying to see if it's actually going to come, come to uh, fruition down the road. So. I'm with you, Paul. I'm a, I'm a jump in kind of person too. I'm like both feet, let's go, let's give it a shot. Let's see what we can do. Right. Uh, I'm willing to try to break everything, you know, <laughs> and, and John, John and I now are going on our, we're going on five years of uh, just, I, I, for me, it's just been having a great time and, and uh, you know, jumping in and just trying stuff, and and you know, John and I like two mad scientists, you know, putting things together and saying, ah, that worked great. Yeah, let's keep, let's keep doing that. Um, and 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 we're in a similar situation too, where we're not just serving one or two programs. You know, um, I my background is medical, uh, but uh, but we're not just serving the medical programs anymore. We're 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 doing the other stuff too. Um, you know, right now in, in, in our XR center, we're, we're serving about 19 programs, which is awesome. And I never thought that was going to happen, you know, and our XR center is, we're not even our, our uh, 
well, we were soft open in February of last year. So we're coming up on our on our one year soft open. Um, and, and it's just it's caught fire. So many people want to use virtual virtual reality and and we find so many different ways that we can leverage um the stuff that uh, uh that we that we're already doing uh you know to to make it work for someone else's class too we had architecture students that came in uh and we were using a catechist for it and um and i was like what am i gonna what am i gonna teach architecture students i don't know anything about architecture at all and i talked to john because his background's in architecture and and it was like, well, let's bring them in and let's show them the different types of architecture that we have in there and all that. And we did that. And I was showing them all the different types of architecture. And we were talking about why we left it this way and why we left it that way. But then we also had the drawing tools in there. And architecture students do some amazing graffiti. Like they were in there drawing <laughs> all over the place and they were graffitiing all the walls and, yes. and, and then they were having discussions about, well, I don't know if that would stick to that type of wall. And so, you know, even like what, what I thought was kind of the craziest learning when they got done with it, they were like, yeah, that was pretty good. We actually learned quite a bit of there. I was like, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and I went from, I went from knowing, thinking I have no idea what I'm going to teach these people. I have no idea what, what, you know, they said, we want to come up and do a demo and we want to learn about virtual reality. And I'm like, I don't know what to teach you. And, but, but we just went in and, and we kind of did what we normally do with that natural flow and, and, uh, and it worked great. It was, yeah. it was awesome. Phil, yeah, plus there's back. a really big wow factor when you go into it anyways. So. And that's full circle to exactly what I was saying, like the learner centered approach. If, if we can allow our faculty and our teachers to be comfortable in that learner centered approach, Man, why would you have to have a script in front of you at all times? Why couldn't the, the students start to dictate where the fun is, where the learning's happening, and then you can kind of join in as the expert to kind of lead them down that path? I think that's awesome. Perfect story for that. Okay, I'm going to interject because we've got five minutes to the top of the hour, and I want to make sure that if there is some discussion that needs to be had or questions that need to be answered by the group, I want folks to open up their mics and let's just talk. If you have something you want to share about how you're using a catechist, if you have a question for Paul, a question for Bill, a question for John, um, a question about using a catechist. Uh, again, you know, this is community of practice. How do we use this platform? And, and this is just really exciting to me to hear this conversation because I really do feel like we're on this cusp of a new wave and a new way of, of learning. And I think we're only seeing the beginnings of where this is going to go. You know, as these platforms get built out more and more and more, right, we're going to start sitting. I have periods now where I put my headset on to work in my computer, because instead of having one laptop screen, I can have three laptop screens. And I mean, that's just productivity right there. Now, imagine that when you can, you know, translate that into teaching and translate that into learning. And, you know, that's what, what's being built at Academy. So I'll stop talking. And and how about it, group? What do you want to contribute? What do you want uh, to talk about here in our minutes left? This is more of a comment than it is a question. Um, mm -hmm. At IMSH, I sit on one of the board, executive boards for one of the um, AV companies. And uh, one of the comments during that discussion was the use of VR, the capability of being able to pull it into a video platform to record, um, and also the usability in this one particular board member was discussing the various types of VR, um, and I'm, I, I talked to you about this, John, already, but I'm pimping you out, but um, the... Uh, the usability and the flexibility of uh, the various VR programs that when you purchase, you're kind of locked into, as what you were mentioning, Paul, you're kind of locked into a uh, what they feel is the correct way to do things. And it may not be um, nationally or locally accepted uh, way of practice or best practice based on those uh, various aspects. And um, just in my um limited use not anywhere near what bill's capacity is but um from what i've seen at the college there is more greater um accessibility and um way to tweak and to make it 
um, how we're used to delivering simulation where we have various types of uh, customers, stakeholders that want to come in and use it. And it's just not a one package deal. So, I mean, it's just what you have with the house. I'm just thinking of multiple different types of aspects that can be used, you know, yes. from different therapies um, as well as um, police and fire uh, EMS and so forth. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Jeff, what, what was really great was when we were doing some uh, simulation with nursing, uh, nursing had come in and said, you know, we would like this, this scenario, right? They, so they brought a scenario to me that had already been, had already gone through all of, uh, so, uh, Jeff is our, our, our director of simulation. And it had already gone through all of the required steps that were necessary for this simulation to be, be counted as a simulation, right? Like there's a lot of steps that it needs to go through. And um, and there's a lot of people that have had hands on it and made sure that it's approved. And so if they brought it to me and I said, no, we have to change it and do it this way, because that's the way the VR platform that we're using works. They, this would have never happened. Nursing wouldn't would have laughed in my face and walked away. Right. And so what was great about it is they brought me a scenario. They said, this is the scenario that we want. These are the things we needed to do. I went in there, I built it, I put it together the way that they wanted it put together. I had them come in, I had them preview it and go, okay, we need this, 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 and this. And then we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we need this, 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 and this. We built that in there. And then we finally, you know, we, we run it now pretty regularly, but, um, but then we're always kind of going back and circling back and debriefing on it. And, you know, it was neat, like one of the open RNs, was you know, this patient is a he's a uh, uh, he's a CHF patient and basically they have to make a decision whether or not they want to give him a, a pill nitroglycerin or a patch nitroglycerin and the 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 silliest thing that just got me going I love this was the students grabbed the patch they pulled it off and they were like where's the garbage can <laughs> I, I didn't have a garbage can in the simulation and they went where am I supposed to put this thing? And I went, oh. <laughs> so the that night I went in and said, garbage can. Boom, there we go. <laughs> so, you know, and it and it happened again with something else. But that was that was exactly what I was that's that's what I've been looking for, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, we don't have much time left, but I just the hour. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I just wanted to double click real quick on a, a couple of points that I think are important that, number one, we're taking simulation out of the simulation lab, which I think has exponential potential in the bigger picture, right? You know, the, you know, simulation labs are, we, we know that this modality works. It's been tested for decades. It's an incredibly important learning modality. And the more students that we can get in there, the more instructors we can get using that modality, the better. So, you know, sim labs tend to be very expensive facilities with very expensive mannequins. You just can't open that to all your students to just wander around anytime they want, just walk in there, you know, but if we can kind of like expand and augment that existing modality with this virtual dimension, it seems like there's a lot of potential there. And then the other thing I want to, to underscore is that, you know, there tends to be this attitude, especially at IMSH, people approach and they, they feel like they're late. You know, they're late to the game. Like, well, everybody else already has this figured out. We haven't done anything with VR. We're way behind. And I just want to kind of emphasize that, you know, like, like you know, Paul and Bill are talking about, uh, you know, they, they're just, they're like testing and building on this new frontier. Like it's a whole new world. N nobody has this figured out. <laughs> we're We're just kind of ripping and tearing and sketching and, and that's, I think, the the reason we built a catechist the way we did. It would have been so much easier, I think, for our development team to just build some step-by-step -step scenarios like everybody else. I mean, that's that's the easiest thing we could have done, but we took the heart. Like, it's very, very difficult and expensive to build the types of tools that it takes to be able to just, well, whoops, there's no garbage can, you know? And then the instructor can go in and say, I need a garbage can and and do that change instead of going to a team of programmers and waiting, you know, several weeks and then, okay, now your update is done. And, um, you know, building those tools, I think, puts it in the hands of the instructors 
which I think is in the bigger picture going to allow them to sketch and rip and tear and build and test and prototype and get us into that new dimension, into new territory that simulation currently isn't, which I think is pretty exciting. And I used a garbage can from our safety simulation. And my first thought was, no, I can't use that one. I got to get an empty one. And then I went, wait, why? When would it that, ever be? That's perfect. <laughs> it's overflowing that, and you got to identify yeah, that it as a hazard. garbage can is full. <laughs> <Failed> <laughs> as I, I know that so, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're supposed to be working on this patient and deciding whether or not you're putting a patch or you're giving them a patch or a pill. But you know what? There's this other thing that's happening too. Because, you know, in in life, I mean, like that never happens, right? You never have it where two things are going on at once. And so, yeah, so they were like, oh, wow, this is really full. And then they emptied it and then they put the, it was great. It was perfect. I think one thing I would add to kind of finish off everything is when we've been going through this entire process with John and Stefan and everybody else, the ability to think freely and dream about what could be has been the absolute best part of going through this experience and this ride with the Catechist. We've been able to ask for something and say, is it possible? And I don't think I've ever been told no. <laughs> and if it isn't there now, it, it might be there in the future. And if we ask for it, it will be there in the future at some point in time. And I think that's some of the coolest stuff. So I'd like to leave with a couple of things that we had talked about earlier for fantasy or dream ads for a Catechist, which um, Rick, you had talked about the web browser being inside, and I think that would be fantastic. Having the ability to search and do those types of things from within VR would be fantastic. I had to express one of our things of the ability to have uh, like a pain or something, a visual representation of pain on the user themselves. Whereas like in that farmhouse, if they were to pick up a needle or bump into a wall or a sharp object that you could see like redness around the elbow or, or pain on, on the fingers and the hands. And the last one that I would say just from the conversations we were having is the ability that you could potentially take notes. Um, like Bill was just talking about, if, if somebody was in there and was able to say, I need to take a couple notes to improve this, like as a faculty member, as I'm walking through this, and then those notes could be easily exported out of a catechist and into a document, that'd be a quick and easy way to kind of be in and out of the place at the exact same time. And I think those are all pieces of the puzzle that we might see in VR in the coming years anyways. So. I just, I really say just thank you for all of the time and, and the effort. Uh, a special thanks to Stefan. I know he's not on the call anymore, but he has been absolutely fantastic to work with and, and just a dream to work with um, as is everybody with the company. But but thank you for everybody. It's been, it's been a real fun ride so far. Well, and thank you. Thank you for the big thinking. Appreciate yeah. it. Really, really do. And with sharing your insights too, we really appreciate you stepping up and being able to share the, the things that you're working on and, uh, you know, and I want to invite anybody else that wants to be, you know, uh, wouldn't mind sharing your stories with these communities of practice events. You know, we've got one every quarter. So who 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 will it be next quarter? You know, if you're interested, definitely send us a note. We're really excited to hear your stories. So. We really want to hear what you're doing. Like I was I was I, I told Paul that I was going to take notes during this. Uh, actually, what happened was when we got off the call. I grabbed my phone and I started going, okay, what did he say again? Okay. Oh yeah. Because I, I like, I want to hear what other people are doing. You know, I'm, I'm, we're all in the thick of this, you know, it's not like we're uh, like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, not using the platform. I am using this platform on a regular basis and I want to know a better way I can use it. I want to know other things that I can do. I, I put the link tree link back in the chat one more time as a reminder. Again, we have that private Academicus community of practice group on LinkedIn where you can share ideas about the platform and how you're using it. It's not going out to the public. It's with other Academicus users. So I encourage you uh, look that up and, and join us there as well as on all the other platforms, Facebook, X, uh, Discord. Um, uh, Bill is getting ready to upload a bunch of his videos onto our YouTube site, where you can learn so much about what you can do with the Catechus. Um, and Paul, you and I are meeting Friday, and we're gonna we're gonna have a blast. Yeah, I can't wait. We're gonna build the coolest <laughs> lobby starting gate for everybody and everybody because I have all these different departments that all kind of want to start. 
the hardest thing is to be left off in a social work house when you want to start the next scene in a, or the nursing group and whatever. We're going to start in this awesome new space age lobby repository where we'll have the ability to go wherever they want from that space, kind of like the landing spot you guys built in a catechist. And I think that'll be a nice new fresh way for all of our departments to kind of have the same landing spot when they start knowing this is how I get to my space versus having to almost have to learn a catechist and how to navigate a catechist just to be able to start using it. So hopefully that'll help too. Can't wait, Rick. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Okay, John, any closing comments? Well, I, I can't, I'd be remiss to not mention that, you know, you're mentioning that but the, the new, we have a new product that we're coming out with called a Catechist Campus, which is exactly that. So you've got six labs, it's a higher price point, but you've got basically a hub that's custom branded. Like you say, you can bring everybody into that hub and then you can teleport off to the different locations, different programs, different schools, paramedics, nurses, you know, everybody's got their own corner of it, but you've got that campus hub that they can kind of gather at because it's the intersections between them that's interesting in virtual reality. Right. Well, different programs are talking to each other and there's overlap. So we don't want to like have everybody going in their own silo. So um, it's great to hear you say that because it's sort of a validation of that direction with the product. <laughs> where, you know, I had we, no we idea, John. Of, I was just off the top of the head. So the, A number of schools have asked about that. So now we came up with the con concept of the Academicus campus. We're going to be launching it at the end of the quarter. At least that's the awesome. plan right now. So um, cool. look forward to sharing more about that, but just wanted to kind of preview that. So thank you everyone for coming. This is really great. Great turnout. Great to see everybody. And uh, stay tuned for the next community practice. We, we're also going to start having weekly live events um, that are just open to the public, like office hours. You know, we're just going to open it up and, you know, share it. If, if, you, if you have questions or you want to like, hey, let's build a scene, you know, if you have a request, you know, we can do that on the fly. We'll open up the headset, you know, put on the headsets and go in there and edit the scenes together and uh, we can showcase new content, you know, whatever we want to do. So uh, look forward to that. So I'll be sharing that in our newsletter coming up. So awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank we'll you. Bye-bye. Thanks, we'll everyone. See you, around. see you next time. Great to see everybody. Take care. Well, that's it. That's it. That was great. Hey, great job. Uh, Paul, great that was job, Paul. Great job. <laughs> that was awesome. The you know that's that's what people need to hear is how other people are using it and and mm -hmm. you know because the the thing is is that e even though you may not have somebody speaking up, you know they may be sitting there going. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to get the money right on this. And I guarantee that happened. I guarantee I at having... least one or two yeah, people yeah. on this call were in the back there. I saw them like writing things down yep. every time, yep. you know, they would say something and they'd go all back to their notes. Like, yep. for sure, thinking... we'll get some people reaching out saying, you know, Paul mentioned this and like, <laughs> it, got, it got me thinking. Yep. <laughs> Bill, it helped so much in it, that free so... talk that we had at noon when you were like, just have the discussion. Yeah. That you when you yeah. said that 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 opened me up to just be like cool because it's so much easier for me to talk off the top of my head and yeah. to talk more genuinely about how it happened because yeah. organically that's exactly how it happened. I, I wasn't trying to fabricate anything. It, it was organic through and through. And then like when you were able to chime in and tell me your side of it, I'm like exactly. That's exactly why it's so in, enticing for me at least. So yeah, I'm with you 100. percent And that was the way it happened. You know, like with me and John too is you know uh, carly brought me Car carly said meet me at this office you got to check this out you might be able to use it you might not maybe you'll like it maybe you won't and i went in there i sat there with john because i was early so john and i sat and just talked for a little bit and then i went in the headset and i was like yep i'll take it let's go <laughs> and it, you know it was just like that i was like yep give me the heart Give me that heart. I want it. I'm gonna, uh, you know, make what make a big one, make a small one, make a medium one, make one that I can wear as a hat. Make because <laughs> I teach the same way that I talk. Yes, exactly. You know? Yes. So you know, I'm like, so ah. you, Carly and Alan were there the week before that, and yep. Alan and Carly took the headsets off and they looked at each other like, Bill needs to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, who's this Bill guy? And I was a little yeah. nervous when you came in because they had talked about like, Bill knows all about this stuff. Bill will know. Yeah. Bill will be able to tell us whether this is going to be valuable or not. 
yeah. and then you got there early and I'm like, okay, well, then I just, we went in and went right to the heart because you were interested in cardiology yep. and you were like, okay, I t- I'll take I'm, it. I'm good. I'll take it right now. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> and that's just it too. And that's why, that's why it's been, you know, I mean, that's why it's been five years. That's why we yeah. have stuck with a catechist for so much and so long. And, you know, I told somebody, hey, who was I telling the other day? It might've been in just a conversation that we were having in San Diego is that I said, we, we have put a lot of our eggs in one basket for a reason, yeah. because we wanted all of the things that a catechist provides. And, you know, we could see five years ago where we would be in five years. Right. You know, we had an idea. We, we knew that this was going to be big. I don't want to keep saying I, because that's not fair because we've got Carly, we've got myself, you know, and, and we, we, Carly and I had so many discussions um, and she's like, you've got to give me feedback. You've got to tell me what's good. You've got to tell me what's bad. That's not a problem. I will tell you what's good. I will tell you what's bad. I'll be, I'll be on about it, but I'll be on completely honest about it. Yeah. But, um, but it was just, you know, and, and getting to work with the people that are actually building the stuff like that, that's, you know, when you yeah, go, when... the sim template came out of bill. When right. I was talking to Stefan about it, I was like, you do realize that I now have to interface with somebody who's never dealt with simulation before in some of these other departments. When you deal with nursing, they already know what simulation is. But when you have to teach them what simulation is, why is a pre-brief necessary? Why is a debrief necessary? What scenes, what are assets, and why do you phase it? Why do you yeah. push in triggers and, and facilitation? That's like a learning curve for a whole different group of people. And yet Stefan was like, absolutely, we got it. Here's the template because we were ready and prepared for these types of things to come on board. And then it just morphed into better and better versions yeah. of that. And yeah. I, I've been using that template in some of my master's level courses um, to show other people how to develop from the what to the why. And, and that's how I describe it because you have to impart that if you're going to get Stefan to draw a circle around a tree with the dog mm-hmm. chain to it, he needs to know the why. Otherwise mm-hmm. there's going to be grass growing and there isn't going to be, you know, there's going to be things that offset that whole part of it. And so that's always been a big key for me too. I, I think, I think half of the Academicus staff, um, ha, you know, like they, sh- they should get their paramedic patch at this point. Like, yes. They've listened to me <laughs> yes. long enough, you know, like my, my <laughs> students only had to go through two years of this stuff. Y'all have been through five. <laughs> So, the you know, best, like, the best um, salesperson slash trainer from Laredal that ever showed up at our doorstep here at MSU was an ex paramedic EMT. And he was in, he was an EMT for 25 years and now he's selling mannequins and he can do and say things that I wouldn't even know where to begin with those mannequins because he's been in the field. He goes, did you know, you can do this, this, and this. And I was like, no, I wouldn't even know what you're saying right now. And it's all <laughs> to me. But those people with such experience. And that's what I was telling you, John, about Mitch's value to, NWTC uh, or whatever that school is up there, his value is the fact that he was an ex-nurse. So yeah, right. when the, the nurse comes up to him, she's like, I need an NG tube insertion. He already knows what that means and how he's going to build it. And then he's the one building it. To me, mm-hmm. that's light years above everything, you know, that even Stefan or I can deal with because we just don't have that background, that skill set with those things. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. This was a fun time. I had a blast. Oh, thank, thank you, really Paul. Great. Really appreciate you doing yeah. this. This is great. Excellent. I hope to see you guys soon. It'd be a lot of fun to have these discussions every now and then. Like yeah. I say, once a week. Right I think the first one I'm looking at, I'm starting to think, dial in on February 9th. So yeah. I don't know what time of day, but, um, and then from there every week, you know, because we've got a theme every week in our social media campaign. We're talking about facilitation, scene editing, you know, featuring customers, content coming up. Awesome. And then that week, I want to be able to use that time to just talk about like, you know, Monday's newsletter was all about the Gen 2 patients. Have you seen one? Let's open one up. Let's look at it. Let's look at all the stuff and let's answer questions, you know, and we'll record it and share it. Maybe nobody comes, but we'll have a recorded longer tale that people can watch anytime. So I think it's about time we open that up. You know, people have asked about yeah. it and sort of like in lieu of a podcast, we just have a live event every week and we just talk just like we did today, you know, in the pre-meeting mm-hmm. earlier like yeah. if we recorded that, we had a we have an episode there, cool, <laughs> you know. Like, right, yeah. And then we did it again for the live, you know, sure. for the community of practice event, which is great, you know. But I think we could we could do that every week. There'd be always something to talk about. Yeah, yeah and John, um, I, you know, like I've said, I I really do want to be involved in that, and and you know, as as much as possible. Um, f- those Fridays are perfect 
Okay, like good. I was going to ask, what and... time of day? I mean, I feel like if we go too late in the afternoon, people start yeah. to check out. Friday, the usually the best for me. I already schedule lunches on my on my schedule. So if we're talking an hour, hour and a half, whatever, that's actually perfect timing. I, I usually schedule my lunches at like 1130 or 12 or something like that. And then Carly and I usually do our one-on-one -on -one at one o'clock on Friday. So, you know, and then after one o'clock, I'm open. But like you said, a little too late, you know, could be. So in that 11, lunch hour. 11, 11.30. I think in that lunch hour, too, because then on Fridays, you're going to get a lot of people that are going to want to do like lunch and learn. Mm -hmm. And you could almost focus it in that way. Like it's a, it's it's like a lunch and learn. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're not serving you lunch, but. <laughs> yeah. Noon. Virtually. You yeah, can watch I will in virtual, virtual reality. <laughs> I think Miles has some strawberries in his scene. And yeah. we, can, we can put something together. <laughs> we can he definitely. Need them anyway. He's allergic, so. Yeah. yeah, he's allergic to them, so he doesn't need them. We can <laughs> give them away. We can have an, have an entire barbecue, you know. We can just, I mean. <laughs> we could. Now we introduce the smells. That'll be when you want to introduce <laughs> the smells. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I uh, smell that rich. That's right. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, jump. Thank, All right, you, guys. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Take care.